world needs to know. New promises. The United States and Global Allies unveils new security assurances for Ukraine at the NATO summit. Flash floods. Emergency hits India as New Delhi and several regions remain inundated with water. Scandal is unveiling. The anonymous anchor tied to the latest sex photo scandal has his name revealed by his spouse. Digital delicacies. The latest tech turns filaments into fillings for some 3D printed sweet treats. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching Adhaderana. We begin in Lithuania as President Joe Biden accused Russian President Vladimir Putin of having a crevant lust for land and power at the end of a NATO summit where Ukraine bought new security assurances from the US and its allies for its defense against Moscow. U.S. President Joe Biden on Wednesday ended this week's NATO summit in Lithuania with a vow of unwavering support for Ukraine and a promise of the military alliance's unity in the face of Russian President Vladimir Putin's aggression. When Putin and his craven lust for land and power unleashed his brutal war on Ukraine, he was betting NATO would break apart. We will not waver. We will not waver. I mean that. Our commitment to Ukraine will not weaken. We will stand for liberty and freedom today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky joined leaders of the world's most powerful military bloc. Ahead of meetings Wednesday, he'd argued emphatically his nation needed membership in the alliance. For that, though, he will have to wait. NATO members, including the United States, said that Ukraine could not join NATO in the midst of a war, but that it could win membership once the fighting was resolved. I look forward to the day when we're having the meeting celebrating your official, official membership in NATO. Thank you so much for this help. At a meeting of the two leaders, Zelensky thanked the U.S. and its citizens. You spend this money for our lives, and uh, I think that we save the, the last for, for, for Europe and for, for all the world. At a press conference, Zelensky called the summit positive, saying it was unambiguous that Ukraine will one day be in NATO. And he's leaving with more than pledges. Zelensky thanked German Chancellor Olaf Scholz for supplying additional launchers and missiles for the Patriot air defense system. The arms cannot come too soon. <laughs> These Ukrainian soldiers told camera that they were in dire need of ammunition to sustain a counteroffensive against Russian forces occupying swaths of the country's east. Ukraine's state border service on Wednesday released aerial footage of what it said was a Russian tank rolling onto a damaged bridge near the city of Kherson. The video shows the tank hit by an explosion. It then attempts to retreat before running off the road. Its crew then abandons the vehicle. But Moscow on Wednesday staged its own demonstration of resolve. The Russian Navy held a launch ceremony for a new missile cruiser for its Black Sea Fleet, based in Russian-occupied Crimea. The vessel is reportedly capable of launching eight cruise missiles at once. Ukraine has repeatedly accused Russia of targeting civilians and infrastructure with long-range missile strikes. Russia's foreign ministry said on Wednesday the NATO summit showed the Western alliance turning to what it called Cold War schemes and pledged that Moscow would, quote, continue to strengthen the country's military organization and defense system. Crisis strikes India as key roads in the Indian capital Delhi have been flooded as water from the Yamuna River has overflowed onto them. The water level of the river has been rising since Wednesday after it reached an all-time high mark in more than 45 years. Authorities have evacuated thousands of nearby low-lying areas in Delhi and have diverted traffic from arterial roads. Northern India has witnessed record rainfall so far this monsoon season, which began in June. At least 88 people have died in the Himachal Pradesh since rains began late this month, while nearby states like Punjab and Haryana have also been witnessing severe flooding. Today, water levels of Yamuna had risen to 208.46 metres from 207.49 metres the previous day the highest in 45 years. 
Water from the swelling river has inundated several low-lying areas and roads. Authorities have shut 17 schools in flooded areas and have diverted traffic away from waterlogged streets. More than 16,000 people have been shifted to relief tents pitched under flyovers by the Delhi government. Seasonal monsoon rains are a lifeline for India but also typically cause deaths and destruction to property every year. India has experienced increasingly extreme weather in recent years. The unrelenting rains come just weeks after an extreme heat wave gripped most of North India. Many factors contribute to flooding but experts say climate change caused by global warming makes extreme rainfall more likely. The extreme weather continues to batter the USA. A prolonged heat wave blanketed a swamp of the US stretching from California to South Florida, with forecasters expecting temperatures that could shatter records in parts of the Southwest in the coming days. It's been more than 12 days in a row of temperatures soaring above 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Phoenix, Arizona. While some have found respite in places like water parks, the heat is showing no signs of going away. At the National Weather Service Phoenix office, meteorologists like Sean Benedict have repeatedly been faced with worrying signals. Once we start to see the reds and the purples, uh, that's when we start to issue our excessive heat uh, watches and warnings. And in the current heat wave, we do have a lot of major and extreme heat risk. Multiple records are close to being broken in the state. Arizona's capital has already smashed the previous number of consecutive days under an excessive heat warning. Tom Frieders is in charge of warning coordination at the NWS in the state. The stretch of consecutive days of 110 degrees plus, uh, specifically for Phoenix, uh, we're at 12 days uh, currently uh, for those consecutive days. The, the record is actually 18 days. Um, so if we can continue, if we continue with this, uh, these uh, extreme afternoon temperatures, we, we, we would be breaking that record early next week. A prolonged heat wave is blanketing a swathe of the United States, stretching from California through Texas and all the way across to South Florida. Forecasters are expecting temperatures to shatter records in parts of the Southwest in the coming days. The NWS has issued excessive heat advisories, watches and warnings for areas where around 100 million Americans live. It's a really significant expans expansion of the heat and uh, daily records could be broken and it looks like the peak of the heat looks to be coming in Friday through uh, next Monday and that's when uh, a lot of records will be in jeopardy. While stifling temperatures gripped many parts of the country, Vermont and other northeastern states barely had time to recover from historic flooding. Extreme weather has also threatened the Chicago area on Wednesday, where video showed sirens warning of tornadoes in the wake of severe thunderstorms. The growing frequency and intensity of severe weather across the U.S. is symptomatic of global human-driven climate change, some experts have said. It's hard to link one heat wave to another with another and, in, and link that to climate change, but certainly we've seen that pattern where temperatures are on the rise. There's little relief in store for Phoenix residents in the coming days. Overnight lows have been consistently holding above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now on to the latest developments from the Asian summit. Asia and Australia pledged to strengthen peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region during the bloc's annual ministerial conference today. Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong said her country will be contributing $775 million to Southeast Asia and Tivolist with this year to promote the region's development. The annual meeting held in Jakarta this year also includes major powers such as China and Russia and comes as doubts mount over the credibility and unity of the bloc in dealing with the region's thorniest challenges. Asia will also hold the East Asia Summit and the Asian Regional Forum tomorrow with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, both slated to attend. The European Union has passed a law aimed at restoring damaged ecosystems. The nature restoration law was passed in the EU Parliament in Brussels, meaning that countries in the bloc will need to restore 20% of the EU's natural land and sea ecosystems by 2030. The European Parliament voted to pass the EU's flagship law to restore nature Wednesday. Lawmakers adopted the proposal with 336 votes in favour and 300 against. European Commissioner for the Environment, Virginius Sinkevechus. 
So this law is nothing less than the flagship initiative of the European Green Deal, nature and biodiversity pillar, and it's intrinsically linked to its climate pillar. It's the first EU legal proposal on nature since 30 years. The law would be one of the EU's biggest pieces of green legislation. It would require countries to introduce measures restoring nature on a fifth of their land and sea by 2030. The aim is to reverse the decline of Europe's natural habitats, 81% of which are classed as being in poor health. This week it was backed by Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, who joined demonstrations outside the parliament. The people in power are continuously sawing off the branch we are all sitting on. But the bill has exposed deep divisions within member states and lawmakers over the proposals. Some government leaders have argued Europe is pushing through too many environmental laws. Aurelia Bainu is a member of the ID group in Parliament. So yes to the preservation of nature, our heritage and our farmland. And no to this absurd and oppressive proposal from the European Commission. It is time you stop harming our farmers and our member states. The EU Parliament's biggest lawmaker group, the Conservative EPP, led a campaign to kill off the bill as some members argued it would hurt farmers and endanger food security. Other lawmakers and scientists have rejected those claims. They accuse the EPP of using misinformation to get votes ahead of EU Parliament elections next year. We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. Two major companies are being investigated by Canada's ethics watchdog after allegations that they have benefited from forced labor done by Uyghurs. Tonight, mounting allegations over forced labor camps in China. Two major global companies now under fire by Canada's ethics watchdog over claims that they have benefited from labor done by Uyghurs, an ethnic Muslim minority that for years human rights groups say have been forced to work in factories across China. A report released by the watchdog saying they received complaints by a coalition of 28 Canadian organizations alleging Nike Canada has or have had supply chain relationships with at least six Chinese companies, identified as U.S using or benefiting from Uyghur forced labor. Another report saying mining company Dynasty Gold's operations in the province of Xinjiang with a population of nearly 11 million Uyghurs did the same. Those people are not there just working those companies uh, by their own uh, free will. But many Uyghurs say they are concentration camps and the U.S. State Department says more than a million Uyghurs have been detained since 2017 and the Department of Labor estimates that of those nearly 100,000 may be working in forced labor conditions. They are forced to work just like a robot. They are not allowed to speak with their own NATO language. They are not allowed to practice any religious duties. Both Nike and Dynasty Gold did not return requests for comment on the allegations regarding forced labor. But in a response to the complaint, Nike said that they do not source products from Xinjiang or use textiles and spun yarn from the region, and adding they don't have any relationship with three of the companies mentioned in the report, and that Nike Inc. has confirmed that their contract suppliers are not using textiles from that region, and that their code of conduct prohibits forced labor. Dynasty Gold's response to the complaint is that it does not have operational control over the mine in Xinjiang and that these allegations arose after it left the region. One of Britain's leading television news anchors, who Edwards was identified by his wife as a BBC presenter facing allegations he paid a young person thousands of pounds for sexually explicit photos, the broadcaster reported. The BBC presenter at the centre of a sex photo scandal has been named. Hugh Edwards, one of Britain's leading news anchors, was named by his wife as the man who's been accused of paying a teenager for sexually explicit photos. It ends days of speculation around a story that has dominated UK media. The news was announced on Wednesday by the BBC itself, alongside a statement from Hugh Edwards' wife, Vicky Flind. Hugh is suffering from serious mental health issues. The events of the last few days have greatly worsened matters. He has suffered another serious episode and is now receiving inpatient hospital care, where he'll stay for the foreseeable future. Flynn said she was making a statement out of concern for Edward's mental health and to protect their children. The story was first broken by Britain's Sun tabloid last week. 
Reporting, a leading BBC presenter had paid a young person around $45,000 for explicit photos over three years, beginning when the person was 17. That detail was a focus of the media attention that followed, as the age of consent for sex in England is 16, but images of someone under 18 can be considered child pornography. The BBC at that point suspended the presenter but didn't name him, while several other BBC stars took to social media to clear their names. London's Metropolitan Police said on Wednesday it had concluded its assessment into the allegations and found that there was no indication a criminal offence had been committed. Edwards, who has five children, has worked for the BBC since 1984 and has anchored its flagship BBC News at 10 bulletin for more than two decades. He's the broadcaster's highest paid news presenter. He announced the death of Queen Elizabeth to the nation in September and has led coverage of the biggest events in Britain since the turn of the century, including elections, royal weddings and the 2012 Olympics. In her statement, his wife said Hugh intends to respond to the stories that have been published, once well enough to do so. Stone-throwing demonstrators clashed with the police and two were shot dead, officers on the scene said, in anti-tax protests in cities and towns around Kenya, called by the opposition reader Raila Odinga. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Against a backdrop of a burnt car and rising smoke, protesters in Nairobi renewed clashes with police on Wednesday. Some of the most intense clashes took place along the expressway linking the Kenyan capital to its international airport. The spark for the second round of protests in less than a week? Tax hikes. Again, you see like uh, young guys, they were crying that they promised, Mr. President, you promised them that you're going to help them, but you didn't. Officers on the scene said two demonstrators were shot dead. A police spokesperson did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Opposition leader Rilo Odinga slammed the police response and cancelled a rally in Nairobi planned for the afternoon, alleging a plot to attack his supporters. We will deny root of the tax as he thinks he can extort from us by force. At least six people were killed last Friday during protests called for by Odinga. President William Ruto was elected last year on a platform of helping Kenya's working poor. But his critics say the tax increases he signed last month will make life harder for Kenyans who are already struggling to afford basic goods like maize flour. They include a doubling of the fuel tax and a levy to fund affordable housing. The government says they're needed to deal with debt and pay for job creation initiatives. Hollywood's writers have been on strike for two months and soon the actors may join them, swapping the red carpet for the picket lines. Jennifer Lawrence might be about to walk off the set. The A-list star is among actors to say they're ready to strike if there's no deal with studios on compensation and other issues. On Wednesday, Hollywood executives were racing to reach agreement ahead of a midnight deadline set by unions. If a strike does happen, it would run alongside a stoppage by some 11,500 who walked out in May. The SAG-AFTRA Actors Union wants compensation updated for the streaming era. With shows no longer repeated the way they were on network TV, it says actors are losing out on the residual payments they used to get. Actors also want assurances that their digital images won't be used without permission and they're concerned that work could be lost to artificial intelligence technology. If a strike does go ahead, it would be the first time that actors have walked out at the same time since 1960, and reaching agreement could be difficult. Disney and rivals have lost hundreds of millions of dollars on streaming over the latest quarter, and are looking to cut costs. At the same time, the rise of online services has eroded ad revenue as traditional TV audiences shrink, Right now, that leaves neither side looking like they're in the mood for compromise. Welcome back. For more news, let's go around the world. Tune in 
tornadoes and thunderstorms battered the Great Chicago area, temporarily forcing O'Hare and Midway airports to hold all air traffic as tornado sirens echoed through the third biggest US city. Auckland's Eden Park will host nine matches during the Women's World Cup, including the opening game between co-hosts New Zealand and Norway. North Korea state-run television broadcasted video footage of the country's latest test launch of its intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, the Hot Song 18. The video showed how Song 18 was designed, allowing missiles to be fired from unpredictable locations. At least one person was killed in a third successive night of Russian attacks on the Ukrainian capital Kiev. Air defenses shot down all 20 drones launched by Russia to attack Kiev and surrounding regions, as well as two caliber missiles in other parts of the country. Suspected gang members in Western Mexico killed four security officials and two civilians and injured a dozen other people after an attack with explosives, which the Mexican government described as an act of terror. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with a digital bakery in Los Angeles that is creating intricate candy treats using a first-of-its-kind 3D food printer that uses sugar to craft elaborate designs at scale. Thank you for watching. Good night.